Hello everybody, my name is uh, Chef Dickie Uzichby. I'm the chef and owner of Sous Chef Catering. I've been a chef since 1997, master chef since the past four years. And I was asked to come and show you how to make bannock. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, I'll give you a recipe of bannock. It'll be on the website after the fact, but I'll slowly throw it all together. Uh, rather than doing all a bunch of chopping, I just raided my own kitchen and pre-measured everything. So we're going to start off first with the flour. So in the air is five cups of all-purpose flour inside a bowl. To this, we're going to add five teaspoons of baking powder, two tablespoons of salt, and three tablespoons of white sugar. Now this recipe is based on a recipe that's been around forever and ever and ever. Bannock actually came with the fur trade and it was called actually soda bread at one time. And then all the, what do they say, the, the guys who came over married First Nations women and they made the bannock better. Instead of using soda, baking soda, they're using baking powder. To that we're going to add some fat, plain old fashioned vegetable shortening. About that much. Inside here, we're going to cut the fat into the flour. So this is the part you work out all your aggressions. And you work the fat through the flour. Making bannock is not difficult, put it that way. But it does have its moments. Especially when you're trying to teach somebody, like say my son. Doesn't quite listen too much, so. A lot of bannock it wasn't turned out, so. The thing is, I've been making bannock since I was roughly about four years old. Um, 47 years old now, so you can do the math. There's lots of bannock I've been making over the years. Since I started Sous Chef Catering, I've made in the excess of 800,000 rounds of baked bannock. So there's not too many people in the world that can say that. I can. So after we do that, it's all mixed in. Slowly add water in until it comes together in a nice dough. Start off a little bit of a so, and then we mix. Now, when you make bread or any kind of bread, especially bannock, if you use cold water, you're gonna have a hard dough. If you use hot water, you're gonna have a very soft dough. So it's kind of a happy medium. You wanna use a little bit warmer than room temperature. And with that, it also takes into consideration of how the weather is outside, whether it's raining or it's hot. That determines whether your bannock's gonna grow or not. So you wanna incorporate all the flour at the bottom of the bowl. Don't waste any flour, as my cooking would say. All right, a little bit of a trick about getting your bannock to be nice and tall when you're baking it. You use a baking pan or a cake pan. I spray oil in it so it doesn't stick. And by doing this, you're actually having the bannock have a nice crust while it bakes. So you get that nice crisp when you're cutting into it. From there, you put the dough in. Like so spread it, let your fingers a bit, and press the dough down. You don't have to put it in a cake pan. You can put it on a baking sheet. If you're gonna do the baking sheet method, you lay it on the baking sheet, you grab a fork, and then you pierce the top of the bannock a little bit so that the bannock will grow to a certain height. So basically that's what this is. Now we have an oven preheated at 350 degrees. You wanna throw it in there for about 35 to 45 minutes till it's nice golden brown on top. You tap the top and it should have a nice howl sound like a, like a drum almost. That way you know it's done. Take it out, let it cool off before you flip it out because you want it to cool in the pan so that it stays this shape. So with that, we're gonna go to the oven. All right, you wanna put it in the oven at 350 degrees for 35 to 45 minutes. And close the oven, and let it go. In about 44, 45 minutes. nice drums it's done all right 
Manic cooled down a bit. So we're going to take it, we're going to turn this out. Like so, comes out. What I was talking about, with a nice browning all the way around. That's what we're looking for. And basically what you do is, I always cut into fives or sixes or whatever you want to cut into. So we'll just slice one off here. Side here. That's what we're looking for. And then like so. That's the panic. Like so. Tastes really good. Basic recipe. But from this recipe, you can turn it into multi dozen different ways of making it. Raisin bannock, chocolate chip bannock, any kind of bread recipe. I have a equivalent in a bannock form. So I have roughly about 150 different types of baked bannocks that I've made so far. The favorite soup for this. All right, I have several favorite, but I have a favorite. Now, ever since I started making, or started sous chef catering, I always had bison barley soup. And basically it's slow roasted bison roasts, as done the day before, I slice it up, it's slow cooked. You take that, put it in a pot with onions, celery, carrots, and slowly saute that together. You add more flour to it, or cornstarch if you don't want to have flour. But slowly add water until it thickens right up to a nice, almost gravy state. And when it's starting to boil, you add some potatoes, throw that in there. And once the potatoes are done, the soup is done. Take a big bowl, fill that up, take a piece of bannock, and you just dip any. A traditional way of eating, we never had spoons and forks. The old people would have their bowl and they'd have their piece of bannock and they'd just dip and they'd use their bannock as a spoon to get the chunks of meat off. And then they use the bannock to clean up the bowl. That's how it was. That's how I was raised. My old people, that's how they taught me how to eat like that. In fact, the old people used to sit up against the wall with their bowl and eat their food. It's funny, you know, they had tables and chairs but they'd, they'd sit against the wall to eat. That, you know, that's the old way of eating. Not that I do that today, because if I sat down, I wouldn't be able to get up, so. <laughs> I was raised by my great-grandparents, Algamegi Nuxish of the Okanese First Nation, and I was a thorn in my grandmother's side, so I started cooking and hunting since I was about four and a half. Baked my first cake at five, uh, made my first wedding cake at eight, and made $110 on it. So that got the bug in me. Since then, it was just thriving to cook. And when I was 13, my grandparents signed a, well, I should say my parents signed a waiver that I'd go work in a restaurant in Malvo. And my first restaurant I worked with was uh, the Flamingo restaurant in Malvo. And uh, it was a Greek-Italian restaurant. And that was my first partake in a restaurant. From there, I've worked in Chinese restaurants. You name it, I've, I've done it all. Kind of in a way, yeah. Yeah, it, it's uh, basically, it ties me back to my childhood, learning how to cook with my grandmother. You know, like she passed when I was 12 years old, so I've been orphaned since 12. So that, she was my cooking teacher. So whenever I do the cooking part, it's like I'm having a conversation with her where she's still helping me, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it, it gives that, that same feeling of something new, striving for something better and that keeps the, the history alive. Always listen, always do what you're told. Keep your area neat and get used to long hours of standing. You're gonna have to put in a lot of time. I mean, when I did my apprenticeship in Royal York Hotel in Toronto, I was putting in 20 hour days. And then they expected me to be back within four hours to start the next shift. So I was going on, you know, four hours sleep. Actually three hours because it was even less, depending on how close you lived. It's like when I worked in Toronto, I was an hour and a half drive from downtown. If you hit all the green lights, it was 20 minutes. But otherwise you're stuck in traffic, you know. Or if you took transit, it was an hour and 10 minutes. So you sleep on the train on the way home, get off, get in your home, sleep, get up go back and start it all over again. You know, it's something that you, if you want to achieve it, you have to put in the time to get it done. And you have to love cooking.
Simplest favorite food. All right. Any kind of meatloaf. Just mix it together, throw it in the pan, throw it in the oven. That's comfort food. Light it up, let it cook. To go with it is mac and cheese. Any kind of macaroni, pasta, cook it. But it's the cheese sauce that's the killer. You start with real cream, real everything. You start off with flour, onions in the pan, brown it up, slowly add cream to it, thicken it. Once it gets to the right thick, then you start adding in your grated cheeses. I use five different kinds of cheeses, two different kinds of cheddar, an old cheddar, an extra old cheddar, an atom, or let's say a mozzarella, something nice and sticky and stringy so that when you bite into it, it just sticks and gets all gooey. And then I finish it off with a nice sharp cheese like uh, Asiago or um, like a Parmesan Reggiano. On top of that, you stir it all in. And when you mix it all together and you serve it, you bite into it, you don't say anything, you just close your eyes and eat it and enjoy. That's, you know, that's what food is. So every time I make a dish, I always compare it. To how did I feel when I ate that? Does this food compare to that? Usually it does. But I mean, it's on a different level, but I mean, that's always, that's my baseline of enjoyment. And there's a lot of chefs out there, they, they don't know where the baseline is. It's like when I came up cooking, it was always large portions, very tasty, and then you serve it to the people. Now, since then it's changed. So now it's little small portions, very expensive, small portions. But when you bite into that small portion, to me, when you're biting into it, it should still have that same effect as me eating that mac and cheese and meatloaf. And if it doesn't, then they fell short. That's my standards compared to every other standards. So, you know, it's to each their own, but to me, I have, you know, I, I have a trained palate. There's not much, like I said, I haven't tried to cook because I've cooked everything from bugs to beef, chicken, all kinds of stuff. Like when I became a chef, got my red seal, I was hired at the Royal York Hotel and they shipped me off to uh, Thailand for a month and we traveled from village to village to village with one of our dishwashers and looking for new flavors. So we went from village to village to village looking for new flavors and every village had a protein. You're lucky if it was a bird, you're lucky if it had four legs because some of them didn't have any legs and some had a crap load of legs and they'd serve it to you. It's like us First Nations people, when you go see your grandma, she always fixes a big bowl of food and sits in front of you. She tells you, eat before you even visit. Shut up, eat, she'd say. And where she'd say, you have food's in the fridge. Come back and talk. So we're at this one village and this little old lady came out. She served me this eight-legged chicken wing. And you know, all the legs are up and covered in hot sauce. She said in her language and I looked at my dishwasher and he translates it. She said, eat. Okay, so I grabbed the leg and you can break it and pull it and all the little stringies came up. And I looked at it, looked at her, looked at him, popped it in my mouth, and sucked off all the meat off of it, and chewed it, and swallowed it. Told her it was good. He said it was good. That was the only leg I ate, because I knew what it was. But it has eight legs, it's big. You know, that village had tarantulas, big spiders. They bred the hair off of them. So afterwards, then I went to go see in the back how this old lady was making these spiders. So she had this big basket, she put her hand in the basket. She got a spider, come out, she throw it in the hot grease and, and hot oil and she cook it, deep fry it. And every time she grabbed it, she said, oh, mm, spider bitter. And she threw it in the oil. That's what she did over and over and over. And when I looked at the old lady's hand, she had a black mark right under her hand right here. I was from where those spiders were biting her for years and years and years. And I asked her, I said, do you actually feel the pain of them biting you? She goes, no, I just say it because it's just habit. <laughs> I had to end it off with a gross story, but you know, that's, that's just the way I am. So just thank God I'm not cooking any spiders today. It's just panic. <laughs>